Blessings, beloved. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, as the saints of God, sometimes we're just walking down the street, sitting on a bench, and we have this and another shackle bond is lifted and we're delivered from something else and we come to the realization that we've been delivered from something when it presents itself and it causes us to just just to burst out laughing or something <laughs> somebody might be like you know what's going on why is that person just laughing because just the joy just it just when you're a saint and you've got the holy spirit the joy just bubbles up inside of you so sometimes you'll just realize that you are that you are made free from something and then the realization of having been made free from it causes you to laugh it causes you to bubble over and uh, express that joy you know and today i was thinking like we, we live in a world where it's like there's an expectation now that you're frustrated bored uh um feeling um kind of powerless sitting at home in lockdown um with an overbearing government filling your head with a whole lot of lies about the risks that you're under and and all of this and it's you know is it going to become a crime to laugh you know to to express joy to 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 drum on your legs like it's like who do you think you are that this isn't affecting you you know it's like this is what I'm trying to, you know, as a preacher, this is what we're trying to say. We're trying to say, you don't have to be locked down spiritually. You don't have to be in spiritual lockdown. You can be in physical lockdown and not in spiritual lockdown. Because Jesus has set us free from that spiritual bondage. And it's that realization that there's the physical body and the spiritual body. And then when the spiritual body is free, you're free. Then you're truly free indeed. He, whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. We're free. We're spiritually free. We're, we died and our life is hidden in Christ. Well, I'm still walking around. Obviously, my flesh didn't die physical body hasn't died so what's been spoken about if we died in what way did we die we died in that we were pruned in that we were spiritually renewed we died with Jesus and our life is hidden with him when we put our faith in him he took us under wing he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against you, you shall confute. This is the inheritance of the saints. And the world hates us. It just hates us. It just hates us. You could be sitting there doing nothing, sitting on the wall and the world will hate you. Simply because we're, we belong to Jesus. They hate him for no reason. They hated him without a cause. You know, I had a realization today. I was sitting on the wall in the town. And I had a realization that there's a place I sit there. It's handy. It's just like central to town, and it's it's on the wall there. It's not really near anybody, um, and I just sit there, and listen to my music, and. Um, Maybe I'll mix it up and go somewhere else. But um, I was sitting there and it came into my mind, you know, I was, I was just tapping, I just felt free and I was just tapping on the railing there, like drumming on the railing. Because I, I play a bit of drums, play a bit of percussion. And um, every now and again, drummers will tell you, you just get an urge to tap something and you just, <laughs> it's just like second nature. And, um, so I was doing that, tapping along to the music I was listening to, and uh, realized, you know what, I'm 
I'm free. I'm free of this bondage. I'm free of this spiritual lockdown. I'm set free. Jesus has set me free. When he died on the cross on the hill of Calvary, he set me free. He paid my sin debt. So we don't have to fear anything. We don't. We don't have to fear the world when it comes against us. We don't have to fear people when they threaten us, when they try to intimidate us, when they just hate us for being Christians. We don't. We don't, we don't have to fear. We don't have to have any fear, nor be in awe of them. And though we are slight and um, in power and finance, and they are mighty and uh, physical strength and uh, finance and even in technology, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he's ultimately the almighty one. And ultimately the most meek. He truly is precious. Because from him comes all life. He's precious. And there's none like him. And that nobody can do what he does. Nobody can sustain life. Because only God is immortal. In that it is his. Immortality belongs to him. It is his. He can clothe you in immortality. And give you everlasting life. And sustain your life eternally. But it's ultimately him. Who is immortal. He's eternal. He's an eternal being. And eternity belongs to him. Eternal, the eternal nature, the immortality belongs to him. And we're made from the dust. And life is a gift. And he shares his invariant, uh, sorry, um, eternal attributes with us. Invariant and eternal attributes. Like love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. The kingdom of love. The fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love is patient. Love is kind. And when you're in that bondage, and I was, when you're in that bondage, that spiritual bondage, love can seem like something weird, something other. Like, that's weird. Like, what, what's going on there? But when you're free from the bondage, you can see the purity of love. You can see that it's the lasting kingdom. That love is all, is the most powerful. That it is the light. And that the darkness has nothing to do with it. It can't be in its presence. It must flee from it. And so when somebody who has the Holy Spirit in them is around, that means that the darkness is, un is threat feels threatened. Which is not, it's not our fault. We just, we just love. We're just from the kingdom of love. And we're not ashamed of who we are in Jesus. It's who we are. We love him. But all life is sustained by Jesus. All existence, all creatures are sustained by him. He is. I am that I am. He is transcendent of all the created things. And I know that's a lot to try to wrap your head around. You can't because that's the nature of the word transcend. transcendent. The word transcendent means, in simpler terms, bigger than. Um, to give you an example, an iPhone 
would transcend one of the apps on the iPhone. Okay. So, because God is transcendent, because he is the creator, we must obey him and walk in his commands. We must. In order to be with him and of him, we must obey him. And so in, you can inherit eternal life. You can inherit the peace and the spiritual freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. Because we don't allow that to become a, a point of awkwardness or weirdness or uh, discomfort or anything like that. Because we're not given to those spirits. We don't allow them to set up camp in our temple, in our body, in our mind, in our spirit. We don't allow them to set up camp. We're nothing to do with them. And they must flee from us because we're of Jesus. But we're not hostile to anyone. We're not. We're simply not hostile. So when you realise, when you come to the realisation that, um, you know, you see it, you see things more clearly when you're when you're walking in love and when when you have the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is trans transcendent, the Holy Spirit can reveal things to you that you didn't priorly see. And then once you get that um revelation, then it can it can make you laugh or you know, spontaneously or and this is you know this can be a new experience for you as a believer. That you can just be walking down the road and suddenly you'll get laughter or suddenly you'll get something that you didn't experience before and it gives you the, the bible says that we as christians have a down payment of the holy spirit and that's what keeps us going it's a down payment so that tells us that there's so much more for us when we actually when we're actually in the presence of the lord that we have we've only seen a snippet but it's so encouraging to keep us going. It's enough to keep us going towards salvation, to want to keep chasing, running our race, to finish our race, no matter what happens, that nobody takes our crown and we walk in love. But ultimately, when somebody, when somebody makes it very clear to, you, to us as Christians, we're not interested. That's fine. We respect that. We have to. However, when you're a street preacher, the few cannot, you know, usurp the many and say, well, you're not coming in here. You can't talk to that person. You can't talk to that person. That's, you can't, they can't do that. Because everybody has freedom of conscience. It's an interesting point because, you know, in Ireland, the parents are allowed to bring up their children in whatever faith they want to. Um, obviously, if you have if you come from a broken household and your child isn't living with you, that becomes, of course, it becomes more difficult. But, you know, this is why the enemy tries to break up households, because it gives him more opportunity to get involved and to, and to drive a wedge. It gives him a foothold. It allows him to get the foot in the door. What was I going to say? not like I can rewind the video or something. <laughs> um, oh yes, the, the parents have the right to um, raise their children in whatever faith they choose. But at the same time, they don't have the right to deny their children from hearing what's going on in society. It's impossible anyway. You can't. Unless you start, like they're trying to do, dictating like a mob. You can't say that. Get rid of that person. So there's a human right, and children have this too. It's the right to conscience. 
freedom of conscience. It's a very serious, very important freedom that is extended even to children. It's called freedom of conscience. Okay, So that means the child has the right to hear about things that could ultimately protect them or f um, aid them in forming a balanced and reasonable worldview. Anything else is thought control and a denial of their human rights and freedoms. So um, there are laws in place that you know must be adhered to, must be obeyed. Um, you know, shutting people down is one thing. Saying I don't want to hear that is fine. You can say that, and um, you know, because a public place is a public place, you can't go around saying I don't like what you're saying. You have to leave because I'm sitting here having an ice cream. Hmm. That, that's. I mean, that's not constitutional. It's that person has the right to speak, and you have the right to eat your ice cream. If that person speaking is a, is an issue you can leave N now you could say well if you have um, a shop in the area you can't exactly leave because you have no but when you take a shop in a public place you understand that th these activities take place there and you understand that you might not like what everybody says there you might not agree do you understand what I'm saying it would be very childish and immature immature to think otherwise, that you're going to agree with everybody who's there, and if you don't agree with them, that you can just call the police and get rid of them. That's unreasonable. It, 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 that would be it, that would be an, a, a exceedingly childish society. It would be a, a society that would be like schoolyard tactics. However, being that we live in a society that affords because God is almighty over all in our country, in our state, he institutes certain rights and extends them to us. When Jesus died on the cross, we came into a grace period and that grace period afforded people time to repent. Now, the flip side of that is that they also had time to continue rebelling. if they so cho chose. And they also had time to continue influencing others to rebel if they so chose. Now, that just means that they're heaping up God's wrath against themselves. One item on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. It's not good for those people because they keep heaping up their offences against God, trampling the blood of Jesus, even, they, even though they know better. That's serious stuff. That's really serious stuff. When a person sets themselves up against God's people like that, and rebels against his kingdom like that, and purposes their efforts to come against him despite the fact that Jesus died on the cross and paid for their sins they are heaping now that means piling like heaping up their offences and that causes us to stress as saints not just like it causes us mourning and grief not just because you know they're coming against us that's that's the smaller part of the issue that's the smaller matter the greater matter is that they're making things exponentially worse for themselves on judgment day and we don't want that At the same time, as Christian preachers, we have to do, we have to obey the Lord and we have to come for the sheep who will actually receive the message. The people who will actually receive what we're saying to them. Now, to some extent, I'm talking shop. 
But on the other hand, all of this stuff is available in the Bible. This is important to state to the um, sheep of God who will watch this video. My brothers and sisters who will watch this video. Whom, because of the current situation, I can't just go and go to their house and you know, have a cup of hot chocolate and talk to them about these matters. So we use available modes and also there's there are other people i know like if i was a younger man perhaps i don't know this for certain but if i was a younger man and i saw a video like this that explained things to me it may have had a different inf influence on my life i may have had it my life may have taken a different course and and large we have largely a fatherless society in this day and age and if there would be anybody who would watch this video who could take some wisdom from it, well, then that's a bonus. Because the Bible tells us to love everybody and honour everybody. And we have to show wisdom in all that we do. And the more God reveals to you, the more responsibility comes with more revelation. I don't know who says ignorance is bliss. I don't agree with that statement, but I see what they're trying to say. That when you know more, you become aware of more problems, more issues arising, etc. It's like a little baby sitting in, in the buggy is only thinking about the soother and looking around. Now, obviously, behind the scenes, there's a lot, lot of computing and development going on. But in their conscious mind, they're just chilling there in the buggy. Mammy's pushing, right? So to some extent, it's a peaceful time. So as we develop spiritually, and in our mind, different layers and levels of revelation come to us. It's like peeling back layers of an onion. And so we learn to behave in such a way that is meek, mild and gentle, and at the same time bold, so that our message is heard and received. Now, of course people are going to say that's too loud and then not discuss the volume it's too loud right let's go discuss the volume change the subject so anytime you ask for a solid parameter to be put in place that we can all abide by so that the message can continue to be uh, distributed disseminated and preached that we don't want to talk about that because they don't want a system by which we can reasonably comply in order to continue giving our message and engaging in our ministry. That's what it appears. That's what it seems. Because I would happily comply with a decibel limit on a little amplifier. Happily. Obviously, it couldn't be this low where you couldn't hear it. So it would have to be of a reasonable volume so that people in the surrounding, immediate surrounding area could hear, or even around the corner a little bit. Right? I mean, there's a motorbike passing the window. You can probably hear it. People up the road can hear it. So it's not a, that's not an issue. So it's not an issue that you can hear it around the corner, and that's not it. <laughs> it's not a conclusive test that something is too loud. Right? So the people who manufacture these instruments, these amplifications, these etc. etc they have to ensure that these items are of merchantable quality so if it's a voice amplifier it has to be it it's obviously not going to get very loud if it's a small 15 watt or 25 watt amplifier that's yay big in circumference then obviously that little speaker can only be so loud before it blows so it's not going to do uh damage it's not going to break any decibel limits and then they're probably uh, privy to that information so 
to say to discuss the uh, amplification um, fit for purpose merchantable quality uh, tour guides amplifier voice amplifier as being an issue and then not discuss it is evasive and disingenuous it's pointing to something as though it's the issue and then it's avoiding it and straw manning and going off on a tangent and not facing the issue so that if it was an issue it could be resolved reasonably and then you could move past it and that seems to be the you know the, the schedule of the day vagueness 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 stay vague because the devil's in the detail and if you stay vague the devil has more room to maneuver simple so and when I say the devil I mean the enemy I mean things that uh, are dishonest disingenuous uh, lies and things like that have more room when you're vague this is why laws have definitions and are very specific so when a law is vague it's usually because there's something all right there's an agenda afoot that they don't want to immediately reveal they're testing the waters with they don't know they're not sure they're putting out a few feelers as they say to see what kind of response they're going to get and they use Facebook feed for this as well do a street theater there and we'll what would you do in this situation and then they're that person would do that that person would do that that person would do that build a database and we'll know what each person will do in each given situation and scenario so we can best control the situation should this situation arise in that circumstance and so it's preemptive monitoring of a person's behaviors choices or what they're most inclined to do in a given situation now often a person will say they'll do something differently to how they'll actually do it in the instance but the point is that the majority of decisions are made outside of that instance anyway prior to it or in the absence of it it's like there are laws around robbing a bank but very few banks are robbed but the laws that uh, are surrounding uh, bank bank robberies are further reaching and have further reaching implications they stem out into other areas so that's that's why ultimately um we need to understand that there are human beings with with great minds who are um very learned they're very well educated they've they've been studious in reading many books for many years and have developed their intellect to the point where they can mind map these situations some people have great recall abilities and um, uh, uh, the ability to to understand mechanisms and they can record them and log them and they've eidetic memories and things like that and you'd be you'd be surprised what people can actually do and you can never judge a book by its cover and so it's important to know that not everybody in a position of office is going to want to obey the Constitution there a lot of people who get into office want to change it they want to change it a lot of people because it's an age-old understanding a wisdom a saying that power corrupts but when you put a person in a position of power that it would corrupt them now human beings are very corruptible we are corrupt at the outset we're born corrupted sin lives in our flesh so we're easily corruptible by being given power and the more power you give a person then the more power drunk they become because it's a process of defilement and so they're looking for the same buzz they got the first time it's like somebody who does heroin they'll tell you that they don't get the same buzz the third or fourth time they do the drug if even the second time because the body has acclimatized to the drug and 
serotonin and dopamine stores may have depleted if my understanding is correct so um, because what happens is when you take a drug like that there's a rush there's a, there's an overabundant use of dopamine or serotonin which is usually administered by the body to keep keep your mood uh, balanced and steady and that's why eventually they have to take the drug just to feel balanced and steady and they're not getting the high anymore because the, the levels of that drug have depleted so much and that's why it takes them years to come back sometimes when they take when they come off the drug they're yeah i'm off the drug because they're a bit low because they're waiting for the dopamine and the serotonin to build back up and build back up and that can be a long process plus they're coming off they're withdrawn withdrawing from it so any chemical process that occurs in the brain whether it's by chemical stimulus or environmental stimulus can ultimately if it's a corrupt behavior will defile the person that's why power corrupts puts a person in a position of power they go ooh, do you know that type of thing me mine i can do and so it corrupts them and once they get a feel for i did that then they want to do it again and they want to do it to a greater degree because they want the same buzz they got the first time they did it and so they start to get more and more and more corrupted and then they get more and more power and more and more money and then it's not about the money anymore it's just about the control and then it's not about the control it's just about the um what we can do what we can make other people do the deception look how clever we are and they're so silly and that's what can happen in that situation now often the enemy will take real world situations in in human living and try to apply them to god when that is not something that marries because god is perfect incorruptible cannot lie and so he is unlike any other ruler he's perfect in his leadership perfect in his governance but the enemy will use worldly arguments present them against the throne of god as though they could be as though they were applicable but they're not because God is incorruptible he's not corrupted by power he's Alpha and Omega he made himself least and took all of the corruption of the world upon himself died because of it paid that debt that's not what somebody corruptible does that's what the perfect one does the perfect leader who leads by example in sacrificial love and that's exactly what Jesus did on the, on the hill of Calvary he paid the sin debt by exemplifying sacrificial love and that's what it means to be a perfect leader that you would die for your enemy even while they were hating you and attacking your kingdom that you would lay your life down for their offenses while they were doing them and that you would pray for them while they were doing them forgive them father for they know not what they do you see Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the full implications of their offences. Just like they don't know who they serve. You say, well, we serve Satan, hail Satan, but they don't know who Satan is. They can't fully appreciate because they're made upright in their parts and they're made in the image and likeness of God. They can't fully understand the extent of the evil in that being. They know not who they serve and and the devil knows the kingdom divided against itself cannot stand so he has to make it work and he can use that as a facade to appear as though he's a fair leader and he will purpose things in many different directions to appear as one thing while he's exacting another 
and even within his structures, there are different circles within circles within circles. And so the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing in many cases, it's a need to know basis because one person in a circle might say no to it and the other might say yes. And ultimately, the, whatever the enemy wants will override what they want, but they might not even know. Something could happen behind the back. And they thought they were instrumental in coming to that decision. So there's layers and degrees of deception within those structures, but God is transparent. He has set everything out in his word. I don't need to defend God. I don't. But I want you to know. I want to bring your attention to it. That we're not to fear or be in awe of them. I want you to know that meekness is not weakness, that quietness is not stupidity. That reserving your words and your judgments is wise. Judge not, least you be judged. It doesn't mean don't judge the deed. It doesn't mean don't think. It just means don't judge with finality. The Bible tells us that judgment belongs to Jesus. Why? Because he's qualified. He's qualified. He knows all things. He knows... Um, what you're capable of. So you go to the one who's most qualified to diagnose. If you want um, a swift computer diagnosis of your BMW, you go to the local BMW. They'll hook it up to the computer, they'll give you a diagnostics that's immediately set up for that model. Bim bam bam, they'll tell you what parts you need. They're on order. It should be in by boom. Because the one, and it's, this isn't a perfect analogy, but the one who manufactures, the one who manufactures, what I'm saying here is true, but the one who manufactures knows best about what he has manufactured. Each individual person Jesus created, knit together in their mother's womb, so I daren't judge anybody with finality. I daren't, I dare not, in other words, judge anybody before Jesus with finality, with condemnation. But we must judge the deed. Otherwise, how would you be able to make a decision between right and wrong? So you have to rightly apply the word judgment. You can't just make a broad sweeping statement that says, well, judge not, least you be judged, full stop, end the story, close the book again. Because that's what's going on in society. There are many close the book moments. We just, we just give a verse, that's all we need to know. Then close the book, move on, next subject. But there's more to it, of course. Judge not least you be judged for the standard by which you judge, you will be judged. Remove the plank from your own eye so you can see the speck in your brother's eye. So to remove it. In other words, don't be a hypocrite telling your brother, don't be going out drinking at the weekend when you're going to raves, drinking, sleeping with women, etc. Take the plank out of your own eye before you attempt to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Don't, don't be a hypocrite, in other words. It's not saying don't judge full stop. It's saying judge not, least you be judged. And then it continues on. To explain what is meant by that in context. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, he's saying, there's, if you set up a standard of judgment, then you'll be judged by that standard. 
And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? Why are you looking for the speck in your brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. But you're totally not even thinking about the beam in your own eye. You're not sorting your own stuff out. You're not cleaning your own house. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under foot and turn again and rend you. Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom of his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? You see, what's happening? If if you hear, for with judge not least you be judged, grand lads, let's go to the pub. If you jump on the bandwagon without asking questions, if you're happy with that, that little worm there, that allows you to continue in your sin. Then somebody could preach to you all day but you're still going to choose your sin. You need to seek the Lord while he might be found. You need to seek. You need to seek him. And he will show up. Because Jesus is coming back to the earth and he's coming with legions of angels. He's coming back in power. He's coming back in might and glory. He's coming back. The Lord is coming back. Doubt it not, beloved. Doubt it not. So, there will be moments as a Christian when the, the Lord reveals things to you and you'll just you'll just burst out laughing and then there'll be days where you're just sobbing and the Lord will give you he'll give you chunks of mourning and grief because he wants you to know the truth he wants you to know him in his suffering but he'll give it to you in chunks that you can handle because we're only little men made out of the dust. We're only humans. So he will give us morsels that we can eat. So it says in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I will not let you be tested beyond what you can endure. But some days he'll give you a bigger chunk and it takes you a day or two to recover. So allow yourself this time. Allow yourself this time. Go easy on yourself. But at the same time, be ready to jump back up and get back at it. It's hard. It's hard. Because we love. We love. And it's hard to see people suffering. And it's hard to be rejected. And even when we get rejected a little bit, It hurts. So it gives us a small insight into how the Lord must feel. When you when you do something, you, you make something and you give it to give to somebody and they just dismiss it. It hurts. So, we're certainly with him in his suffering. And we only suffer a little bit compared to what he has, what he has suffered for us. So let us not focus inordinately on the suffering, but let us understand 
that the Lord is revealing something to us because he wants us to know him better. And that's huge, that he would allow us to know him. This is why the Bible says, turn your laughter to mourning. So that we know him in his suffering. The Bible says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we die with him, we shall live with him. But if we forsake him, he shall forsake us. But remember these verses, beloved. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you, you shall confute. This is the inheritance of the saints. The Bible also says, The good things I have planned for you are too many to count. My plans for you are good and filled with hope. Forget not this. Keep this in your heart. Amen. Blessings, beloved. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified. And it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10. Blessings, beloved.